coming out to today's uh, panel. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about seat strategy in the 2018 midterms. Uh, I do want to start with pointing out something that's perhaps, um, perhaps fairly obvious, but I think very, very important, which is that um, whatever concerns you most about the present administration, um, be it health care, immigration reform, gun laws, their attempt at dismantling the EPA or denial of climate change, um, North Korea, judicial nominees, gerrymandering, Russia, it's a long list, uh, gross incompetence. The point is, <laughs> the point is whatever your issue is, it's gonna be pretty hard for us to get much done unless we take back seats in 2018. And we need your help. Uh, so midterms are typically a referendum on the president. If they're not very popular, their party tends to lose seats. Uh, given the historically abysmal, abysmal approval ratings of our current president, you would think that we're gonna clean up in 2018. Um, but the fact is that we actually face some pretty, pretty serious challenges. Uh, so we're gonna talk about those challenges. Uh, we're gonna talk about what's being done to overcome them, and very important, we're gonna talk about how everybody, how you can help. So we have a truly incredible panel of activists up here who are uh, leading the charge to make certain that Democratic candidates have the greatest possibilities of winning their races. Uh, my name is Michael Cantor, and um, I'll be moderating. On our panel, we have uh, Sanjeev Pareri, who's co-founder, CEO of Voter Circle. We have uh, Toby Falsgraf, who is the senior digital strategist at Swing Left. Uh, Rita Bosworth, who is co-founder, executive director of Sister District. And we have Deepak Puri, who is co-founder of Dem Labs. And, and we have Catherine Vaughn, co-founder, CEO of Flippable. Um, and by the way, towards the end, uh, I'm gonna try to save a little bit of time and we will be opening up the floor to questions. And from what I understand, I'll be throwing out a microphone. Uh, literally, I'm gonna be throwing it out, you'll, you'll see. Um, or somebody's gonna be throwing it out. So I, I, I kinda wanna start off with what I think is the question that most of us wanna ask, which is how are we gonna do it? <laughs> what are the keys? What's the, what are the, 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 the real key, the real important strategies to winning in 2018? I know Donnie just talked about some of that, uh, but there are so many factors and strategies that come into play. Can each of you talk about, uh, you know, just a couple of what you believe to be the key strategies for our candidates to win in 2018? I don't know if we're <laughs> Sure. Um, you know, as we, as, as we look at some of the, the groups on, the first thing is figuring out where we need to focus on, and so that's why I get really excited about some of the work that Flippable is doing, that they've done an amazing job figuring out where we need to focus on and which seats can we win. You need to get volunteers together, um, and I think that's what uh, Swing Left and Sister District are doing an amazing job of doing. Um, our perspective is when you look at these local races, and we've done hundreds of these, in our mind, a lot of it really comes down to a popularity contest. You know, at the presidential race, People are focused on Hillary, they're focused on Trump, they have issues. At the local level, if someone you've met at the coffee shop, if he's your friend, you're gonna more, be more likely to vote for him. And so what we do at Voter Circles, we're trying to figure out who are the key influencers in every community and connect them to everyone around them. And if your local soccer mom or PTA leader or school board president or city council person tells you to vote for somebody, you're gonna be a lot more likely to do it. And so we're trying to bring that personal touch and have everything be friend to friend versus be uh, cold outreach. So that's kind of um, our view of the world. Right. So for Swing Left, I think, uh, you know, this isn't, a, it's not a radical shift of strategy uh, in terms of trying to win elections. I think the, the big change or what the Swing Left is trying to do is to empower volunteers to own the, the districts we think are most winnable um, and do it now, uh, you know, more than a year out from an election that most people don't start paying attention to until you know, 30, 60, 90 days out. Um, 
And I think the, you know, that involves voter contact, of course, the grassroots fundraising is a big part of it. But the, the, the key thing, I think, and why I'm so encouraged by this room, this turnout, is uh, this, the need for a cultural mobilization to make this, this moment in the 2018 elections as big or as close to being as a presidential like, level election uh, as we can get. You know, I think most people that signed up for Swing Left um, did so because they needed to do something to try to stop Trump. And uh, you know, the, the first best way to do that is to take away a little bit of his power, by, for Swing Left at least, for winning back the House. So um, that's, I think that's the, the main approach that Swing Left takes. Right. Uh, so I would, uh, I would point out two things. First of all is that we believe that this is a multifaceted approach. Um, we at Sister District focus on state races. Now we very much want to win back Congress but we don't think you can win back Congress in a sustained and long-term way without winning back the states. We need 24 seats to flip in Congress in order to win back Congress. 16 of those 24 seats are gerrymandered by the states. And so the reason we're focusing on states is because we have to build that power from the ground up. In, the, the system is literally rigged against us right now. We have to even the playing field, and then we'll be, we will be able to win back and keep Congress. So that's why we're focusing on the states. And then the other thing that we at Sister District do, which I think is similar to what um, actually Swing Left and Flippable do, is we are addressing the problem that Democrats are a majority of the country, but we don't control any branch of government. We don't have the Senate, we don't have Congress, we don't have the presidency, we don't have the Supreme Court, and we don't have even close to a majority of the states. And the reason is that our electoral system uh, favors uh, geographic locations over population and Democrats tend to be clustered in small population areas. So we have the majority by three million votes, but we don't have any power. So we need to bust through political boundaries and we in blue areas need to be supporting the most important races in other parts of the country in order to rebalance the power. I'd, I'd pick up from something Rita said, which is one of the biggest assets that we have together is the large number of people, like people in this room, who are activated, who were never involved before, and they want to make a difference. That's one. The second thing is, how do you get this activist energy and passion to make a difference in an election? Because we can do all kinds of things, but if it doesn't convert into a vote and it doesn't convert into an elected official, we wasted a lot of people's passion and time. The second element is technology. Technology like Boda Circle, Hustle, others can empower the activists to do more. What we believe at Democracy Labs, like Donnie said, is we've got to combine the activist energy, get them connected into campaigns, empower the activists with technology so they can do a more impactful engagement. And so that is the connection that we're trying to enable. Awesome. Um, I love tag teaming with Rita because she makes all of the great arguments for me um, and very <laughs> articulately. So um, I guess like everyone kind of said great things, so I'll keep it short. I think that there are two, two main points I want to make. One is um, balancing the kind of short-term and long-term priorities. I think as, as Rita articulated, um, we, I think we need to do everything we can to win back as many seats in Congress uh, sooner rather than later, but we also need to be investing in the kind of the unsexy piping and plumbing of our system that will actually allow us to win seats um, in 2020 and beyond. I, I think a potentially, or a really bad outcome could be making some gains in 2018 and 2020 in the House, thinking that we're doing fine, and then allowing Republicans to do the exact same thing with gerrymandering and voter suppression that they did in 2010, again in 2020, and then losing the House for another decade. I mean, if you think Trump is bad now and it's been like eight months, I mean, think about having Republican control for another 13 years. Um, so I think balancing those long-term and short-term priorities is really important. And then the second thing I think is just kind of summarizing what people have said. I think that we need four, sorry, I have lots of lists of two and fours. I think we need four things um, for Democrats to win. We need data to identify which districts to target. 
We need uh, candidates to run in those districts, really high quality candidates. We need to get those candidates appropriate funding, at least to, you know, I think it's, it's an arms race with Republicans and one that frankly will probably never win, but we need to get sufficient funding to these candidates. And then we need to make sure that those candidates are using the funds in uh, you know, really responsible and effective ways using whether it's technology, volunteers, um, running really great campaigns. Um, so I, we kind of, we have, a, a, I guess, a major and a minor, you know, we're focused more on the fundraising and data at Flippable, um, and then there are other groups that are really focused on volunteer mobilization, campaign management, and candidate selection. All of them are really important, and I think as, as we move from 2017, where I think there's this really diffuse progressive energy out there, to 2018, where I think we need to be a little bit more on lockdown and, and kind of um, more streamlined, I think that there need to be better linkages between these parts of the pipeline. It, it's hard for any one organization to do both the short-term and long-term strategy and the you know, candidate selection, data, fundraising, and, and campaign management. So are there ways that whether it's funders or convening organizations can, can bring us together and kind of um, be the seams between organizations working in these different pieces? That's great. Um, Toby, uh, swing left is focused at the top of the ticket, strategically focusing on the House. Um, I'm gonna hope this works and try to pull up a map of the House race. There we go. Um, that's a little scary. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I think it's fair to say that this is the race that's probably most on the minds of Democrats. Can you talk about why Swing Left chose specifically the House? What are our chances of possibly taking over majority here and about some of the strategies that you're utilizing? Sure. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, this panel is amazing. I really, like the long-term infrastructure uh, and long-term investments piece is, is, is super important as we think about, you know, 2018 is we need to win. We absolutely need to win. But if we lose again in 2020 or 2022, um, uh, that's not gonna be great. <laughs> um, so, you know, so Swing Left actually started, uh, the founders, uh, you know, after the disaster selection realized our next best chance uh, to, to kind of insert uh, or have uh, democratic power um, or stop the Republicans from having all the power in, in Washington is to uh, win back the House. And so uh, I think the, the problem they immediately ran into is they didn't know, you know, living in, in uh, you know, Massachusetts, in rural Massachusetts, where do I find my nearest swing district? And so they built the technology for anybody to go look up where the nearest district that could actually be won uh, whether that was Hillary outperformed Trump there or Democrats have performed well there over the past several congressional cycles. Um, and, you know, it, in, in theory, a winnable seat. Um, the, and, and just give people the opportunity to find those, uh, those swing districts and actually start to take ownership of them. So uh, that, to me, is the, is the, the only reason swing left is, is here. Uh, we, there was like one idea, this, this crystallized moment of we have, uh, we need desperately to move now to get people to start thinking about these races and these seats are winnable, uh, but if we don't th start thinking about them until 90 days out, uh, we're already, it's already too late. So, uh, you know, th th that's the, the general theory on the strategy piece of this. Um, in terms of like what we're, what we're doing um, that I think is uh, exciting is, you know, one of the, there's voter contact uh, is, is, is being prioritized uh, pretty high uh, on, the, um, on, on the list of things we're trying to get people to think about doing. Um, it's, it's not easy to year out to get people to, to think about going to knock on doors uh, right now for the 2018 elections, right? Um, and, you know, one of the other ways that we get started to get people to think about these elections is, you'll say, if you're not going to go knock on doors, um, we have, uh, you know, you can chip in in other ways. So our swing left district funds are this pool of money that we are going to, we're collecting at grassroots level um, to hand over a giant check, maybe even a giant check to uh, the eventual nominees, Democratic nominees in these races. And I think they've already, they've already raised something like $1.7 million for, uh, in these 65 districts um, for, for Demo the eventual Democratic challengers, which is not nothing. I mean, you do the math there, it's pretty, uh, you know, a twenty thirty thousand dollars check um, on average is, is a big deal to a campaign, um, especially at that level, so. Right. And hopefully, you know, there's many months to go. Great, great. Um, Rita and Catherine, uh, you guys like to work together. <laughs> um, 
I, I know you're, you're, you're both focused on state races, and I think for a lot of us, we don't fully understand just how important state races are. Some people tend to call them down ballot races, which <laughs> I don't like that term. It sounds condescending, down ballot. These are really important. Um, it's been said that part of the reason that the Democrats are in the mess that we're in is because we spent too much time focusing at the top of the ticket, um, something that the GOP, to their credit, did not. Um, can you talk about just why state legislature is so important and why we should uh, be out working to support our local candidates? Yeah. Um, I, I know Catherine and I have, we can tag team on this answer, but <laughs> let me just give um, three examples. Uh, in Virginia, which is a state that's having elections on November 7th, I hope everybody's involved in that. We certainly are. Um, that's a state that's gone for the Democratic presidential candidate the last three election cycles. They went Obama, Obama, Clinton. But seven of their 11 congressional seats belong to Republicans because the state controls the legislature, the Republicans control the state legislature and the Republicans have gerrymandered themselves into power. In North Carolina, that's a state that goes pretty much 50-50. They went for Trump by like 49%, but they elected a de Democratic governor. 10 of their 13 congressional seats belong to Republicans. In Wisconsin, the case that's in front of the Supreme Court right now, that is in front of the Supreme Court because when they uh, drew the maps after the 2010 census, 48% of people voted Republican, and yet 66 of their 99 seats in their state legislature were controlled by Republicans. So this is why states are so important. This, when the states, when the Republicans control the state legislatures, they gerrymander the districts both on the state level and the congressional level, and then we lose seats in Congress. So we can try to win back those seats in Congress, and maybe we win in 2018 or 2020, maybe we don't, but if the maps are still drawn to disfavor Democrats, we are always going to be disadvantaged. So that electorally is why states are so important, but also states are important because they are laboratories for, states are policy laboratories for national uh, policy, and they are how we build our pipeline of good uh, national candidates. So those are, our, those are the three, the, yeah. our three reasons why we think states are important, and I know Catherine uh, agrees yeah. and has more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just echo that. I mean, I think you did a great job explaining the gerrymandering in particular. So I, state elections are national elections because they determine the outcomes of national elections. I won't go into detail there. Um, I think on the policy laboratory front, I mean, there, states are both where policies are, are cooked up, whether it's the Affordable Care Act having its origins in, in Romney-controlled Massachusetts, um, or you know, a number of, uh, whether it's marriage equality or a number of other decisions that are made at the state level then get scaled up nationwide. Um, they're also where national policy is implemented. So if you look at the inequities and how the ACA has been rolled out because of um, governors denying Medicaid expansion to you know, the low-income people in their state, it, it's the policies that affect our lives are the policies happening at the state level. And I think a lot of people don't, um, don't realize that are really focused on kind of the, um, the, the national news cycle and kind of the, the emphasis on, on the Trump administration, but it's really happening in the states. Um, in terms of bench building, I like to, you know, I think this is a, a good place to use the example of Barack Obama. Um, Obama is the product of a series of flips. So he was elected to the state Senate. I'm probably gonna get the dates wrong. I was, I was in high school and I saw the Obama yard signs all around and I used to think, oh, Obama, that rhymes with Osama. Is he ever gonna get elected? Um, and, you know, so he was elected to the state Senate. The state Senate flipped um, in Illinois from Republican to Democrat, giving Barack Obama an opportunity to make legislative accomplishments that would then allow him to run for U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate flipped in 2006 from Republican to Democrat, giving him a legislative platform that he could use to run for president. Um, so when you think about the, the importance of flipping chambers, it's not just about you know, winning seats for the Dems, it's not about like, a fun game, it's about giving, um, building a bench of politicians who have real accomplishments that they can then use to run for higher office. Um, and then I guess the, the last point I'll make is um, you have a much higher ROI investing in these state races. So they're really cheap. If you think about the average cost of a state race, it's $120,000. Um, the average cost of a House race is about 1.2 million, so 10x, and the average cost of a Senate race is 10 million, so 100x. Um, if you think about the ROI on your investment in state races, given their broad implications for national races, you can't find a better deal. Okay. Uh, Deepak, Dem Labs, um, you guys are a little unique in that, you know, you haven't developed your own uh, platform as much as you're working with all the existing tools and resources and, and recommending to candidates what best, uh, what, what, which tools will be most effective for their campaigns. Can you uh, talk a bit about that work um, and give something of, of an overview of the types of technologies 
that campaigns are utilizing for 2018? Sure. Uh, should I use the slides or wait? To yeah, the and way? yeah, whenever you'd like to. Um, okay, so, so what Dem Labs started, uh, we. There you go. Uh, thanks. So we started off originally right after the election. My background is in technology. I wasn't in politics, but the election changed everything. So along with Donnie Fowler and my wife, we started Dem Labs. And the goal was, what can we do sitting in a blue, blue bubble in the middle of San Francisco, which might help other areas? What we found along the way is there's lots of people like us, who many on this panel, who said, we've got to do something. So we said, what is our best contribution? And so with that process in mind, we started convening functions where we'd bring in politicians and technologists trying to identify issues, find good solutions, and then share them, like Donnie had mentioned. I'm gonna share something which we, I believe is important for 2018. And Rafi touched upon this, and it's all about distribution. And it goes like this. Let me, before we go further, how many people in the audience have had a headache or a hangover this last year? <laughs> 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 All right, so you'll relate to this. Let's go Especially forward. November, no. So when you have a headache, I'll, I'll make a point, it's serious, but think of it this way. When you have a headache, you can get a fix, or your Tylenol, Advil, whatever, and you can go to your local source and get it in a form that's most convenient to you. Then you say, well, you know, you don't have to worry about making the Tylenol or managing the store, but it fixes your problem. Now the progressives, we have a headache. We have a big headache and we have a, you know, he's in DC. Now let's go forward. So there's a lot of good solutions that are coming, but look at 2018. We have, there's gonna be a lot of innovation, a lot of good solutions, a lot of good approaches that are being developed. Like someone said, there's, hundreds, 6,500, I believe Rafi said, races. And these folks are gonna have limited budgets, so they'll have to spend their money carefully and we wanna get them the right tools as efficiently as possible. And finally, there's limited time. By the time we, these solutions come out and by the time they reach the candidate and so on, the clock is ticking. So what I would propose is, we don't develop software, we don't manage activists, but the solution that we need, and this is what Dem Labs is focused on, is how do we come up with an approach when different solutions come out and different activist groups are there, it's scalable. We can ramp up because what's happening in 2017 is gonna be different in 2018, it's gonna be more intense. It's gotta be scalable. The second thing is we all love volunteers. They're wonderful, like, you know, it's a driving force, but the thing is, a lot of people have bills to pay, kids to send to school, mortgages to pay. So relying exclusively on volunteerism isn't gonna cut it. We need to make sure that the ecosystem, the groups in, you know, who are developing the tools, who are serving the customers, they make a reasonable amount of revenue. And finally, innovation is not static. Like, you know, there's new techniques coming out. As new things come out, how do we reach them into the hands of the candidates? So what we're trying to do is kind of like what Rafi said, as new solutions come out, let's get them out there. And Donnie touched upon this, which is, if Tylenol tried to reach every patient directly, they wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So there has to be indirect distribution, which is scalable, and that's in the commercial sector where I come from, it's the way business is done. That means everyone in the supply chain benefits. So what Dem Labs is focused on, and we think this is a crucial criteria, which is it's not just about technology, it's not just about volunteers. We get the fix, we get it into the hands of the candidates so they can run a better campaign. And we believe that there's a lot of groups who already are trusted resources, PACs, state parties, political advisors, consultants, online stores, we're not trying to recreate anything, but how do we get the Tylenols of the world into the places where the candidates can get them easily to run better campaigns? Plus, the people in the middle, they need to get a revenue share. As much as they want to do the right thing, we want them to be sustainable. So Dem Labs is focused on getting 
new innovative technologies into the hands of the candidates as fast as possible and making sure that the people involved in the process are fairly, you know, incented to do the right thing. That's, that's what we're all about. Right. And on the last slide, if you're a volunteer or you have a great solution or you're in supporting candidates, we'd love to talk to you because we want to kind of facilitate this distribution. Can I, can I ask a question? I actually yeah. think healthcare is a really great example here because one of the characters, I mean, with a headache, maybe we know what we should what we should take. But one of the characteristics is really imperfect and asymmetric information. When you're thinking about candidates, especially a lot of first-time candidates who might not know a about the availability of the of the tools or kind of remedies at their disposal, and b who might not have the right brokers giving them that information. So you listed a bunch of categories of you know whether PACs, consultants who are trusted, but actually I think there's very imperfect information about like who is trustworthy. How do you see like how do we develop a viable healthcare market for this this problem that we're seeing in the candidate space? How do we like where are who are the market makers here and how do we make sure that we are assessing both the candidates, the intermediaries, like the kind of whole landscape and, and providing the right incentives so that they work together, they work effectively and, and that the best organizations are rewarded for true impact. So I'll kind of keep it. So the answer is you have to test and iterate, and I'll give you one specific example. In Virginia, we're working with this pack called Win Virginia Pack that Tom Perriello is the head of. They had a requirement where they wanted to create low cost videos. So we reached out to a company called Resistance Media Collective in New York. They were able to put it together. So to go back to your thing, it's gotta be in touch with the campaign on the ground, pulling in an expert and trying it. Did it work? Was it cost effective? Can they scale? Because, you know, I, I, I totally agree with you. We want to get people who are doing the right thing by the candidate and because that's the only way the innovation will get through because otherwise we're in the, you know, we'll be still buying media ads in 2018, which does no one that good. That's just good. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Sang, you're, you're unique in that um, you're not just the founder of Voter Circle, but, but you are an elected official yourself. Um, Sanjeev ran for office in, I think it was in 2014, and won a seat on his district school board. And from what I understand, it was that experience as a candidate that inspired you to create Voter Circle. Can you, can you sort of talk about that, that, that experience and, and what Voter Circle is, is doing in 2018? Yeah, it was, a, it was a crazy experience. You know, when I was growing up, I really struggled with a lot of learning disabilities. And it was my kid, it was my teachers in my public schools that got me over that. And I wouldn't be where I am today without their support. And so when I was established in my community, I thought, hey. And, you know, I, I owe everything to them. Um, and so I wanted to do the same for the kids in my community. So I ran for my local school board and we didn't have a lot of money for the campaign. We had a budget of $4,000. And then an outside PAC came in and put over $100,000 into the race against me. And it got really nasty really quick. We were outspent 30 to one and most people would give up at that point, but we couldn't do that. And we tried to find a different way. And our, our approach was heavily leveraging a friend to friend approach and we were able to win. And that's what led to the creation of Voter Circle. Let me pull up your slides. Can you pull up his slides, please? So I know you wanted to talk about social mapping as well. So can we? Yeah, let's uh, go on to the, the next one. All right, so I think this should play here. There's a quick video that'll give an explanation of how it works. Uh oh. Not playing. Not playing. Oh, oh. Do we have sound? That's a good question. Do we have sound? All right, no, well, let's I'm skip the video. You no. Know. <laughs> All right, let's skip the video. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so the high level, what Voter Circle does is, in real time, if you have supporters of a campaign, it'll figure out all of their friends that are registered voters in a given district. So you can reach out to them friend to friend instead of cold campaign outreach. And then we take all of that data and we create a social graph of the electorate, and we can predict and identify who the super influencers are in that community. And when we talk about super influencers, we're not talking about Katy Perry, we're talking about Mary Beth Bird. One of our local races, um, she was flagged as a super influencer, and the campaign reached out to her and they were surprised to find out that she actually knew 1,200 of the voters 
of the 30,000 in the district. And they didn't know why. Turned out her nickname was the mayor, and she had been the high school PTA president, the middle school PTA president, and the elementary school PTA president. But this was a decade prior, so people had forgotten. She'd never been an endorser, never run for office. She spent five, 10 minutes on voter circle, sent out her message, over 600 people opened it. She got over 100 IDs, and it saved the campaign over 50 hours of phone banking, because they were doing about two IDs per hour when they're doing phone or door. Um, and so they could basically remove all of her phone, all of her IDs off of that, and they could still do phone and door to everybody else that they couldn't reach. Um, and the power of this is, we, this campaign did it during the campaign. What if you could have those super influencers before a campaign? And so this is what we're trying to build with partners like the DNC and others, is trying to build that map so the work you do at state level can be used for congressional and can be used for uh, governor's race. And, and at my level, at the school board level, you know, 6,500, that's state ledge, there's 500,000 elected officials in the U.S., and most of them are local city councils and school boards, and that's the pipeline that gets all the way up. So we wanted to build something that you could win a race with almost no money, um, and that's what we've kind of developed. Uh, do you want to go on to the next yep. slide? So this is what we can build for a campaign. In this example, they got 14 supporters on, and we draw a network graph and we said, hey, here are 40 super influencers that you should target. And, and then go on to the next slide. And what's crazy, if you click on any of those super influencers, we'll tell you those first degree connections and how to reach out to them. So you know when you go on LinkedIn, it tells you who's the friend of a friend? Imagine if you could do that with your electorate and know who the soccer mom is and who everybody that they know and how to reach out to them. That's what we're able to build. Um, and if you're successful with this, go on to the next thing. Um, you can have a super influencer map of your entire electorate. So this is a congressional race that they, we did. And they had super influencers in every single community. And if they were a district that they wanted to target, they would get on and they'd say, hey, who's the influencer that we know in that part of town? Let's have them spend 10 minutes and reach out to all of their friends. And so if there's a certain part of town that you're weak in, so imagine a presidential race and you have to win Ohio or Florida and you have to win certain precincts. And you could actually have Hillary come in and she, all right, she, we gotta win that district. All right, here's the 50 people that Hillary needs to meet that each knows 1,000 people in that town. And personally, with one degree of separation, she can reach out to 50,000 people. And you know, people know about Joe the plumber, right? But what if you could find the Joe the plumbers that actually know everybody, and you can actually have the candidates reach out to them in advance, and you have that data set in advance? This is something that's permanent that you can build, that we can build as a party that grows, that becomes a sustainable advantage that you can reuse cycle to cycle to cycle. Great. Um. So if anyone wants to just reach out to us, it's sang at votercircle.com. That's sang like a sang a song. And everything we do is uh, cheap to free. Um, for a lot of races, we have a free offering that works amazingly well. So I, I have like a dozen questions that I'm dying to ask. And that clock says we have a couple minutes left. <laughs> so uh, I guess I didn't plan well here. But um, I do want to open this up to the floor. So I want to jump to that and give people an opportunity to ask some questions. And as I mentioned, uh, mics were going to be thrown out. Um, somebody has those? S somebody have the mics? Oh, yeah, have no. him go. He can oh, speak loud. Here we go. <laughs> Oh. All right, you guys are probably mostly in blue areas. <laughs> what are you doing in the purple areas to engage? That's where the delta is. Yep. Great question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's where most of us are really focused. And yep. so um, we are doing, for us, we're doing a combination of uh, just digital marketing, digital media, um, bringing on users, not just in New York and California, but in Ohio, in Virginia, where there are elections. We have thousands of volunteers who are um, you know, on the ground knocking on doors and bringing their friends in and using tools like Sangs to, to get everyone involved. So I would say like, we, our focus is to get, to, is to build a national movement focused on state races, and that national movement especially needs to include people who are in those districts and in those states. And, um, you know, a lot of our volunteers are in blue areas because there's this, we're tapping into this frustration of people in blue areas that want to help somewhere. But um, equally as important for us is um, having a presence in the purple or red areas and 
evaluating what infrastructure is there and figuring out how we can amplify that and build bridges between the volunteers in blue areas with the folks that are in the areas that need a little bit of a boost. And so that absolutely is a focus. Um, and that's gonna be, for next year, something that we are embarking on is trying to identify and amplify the, the existing infrastructure so that we can um, kind of all be more connected and, and move forward together as the majority that we are. In Virginia, it's blue, it's purple, it's red, it's, it's everything, and we're spending a ton of time in Virginia. And what we've developed there that we're launching is someone will get a link, that it'll find all their friends that are registered voters in Virginia, it'll strip out all the Republicans, and so it'll basically find all your friends that are Democrats. So if you're in an area where you have a small blue base and you wanna grow it, and you're afraid of reaching out, Voter Circle will find all your friends that are Democrats. In Virginia, what we're doing is voters will get a recommendation on who to vote for based on where they live. So if they live in one part of the state, they'll say, this is the Democratic delegate you should vote for, and you should vote for Ralph Northam. If you live in another part of the state, they'll say, hey, this is a Democratic delegate that you should vote for. So it's customized, location-based messaging for that voter, customized exactly to who you can vote for. So I hate to say it, but we're out of time, and we have a really busy schedule today. Uh, I, I just want to, one thing is you did hear uh, the word volunteer a lot. Um, that's incredibly important. And uh, a couple of folks here even put up slides and said, here, email me. Here's my email address. Please go to their websites, um, sign up, volunteer, help out. That's the biggest, uh, probably the number one strategy that we're going to need to have an effect in 2018. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.